Hi, welcome to this video absolutely all about Pyrite, an updated version, an even more complete version of the video that we did before all about Pyrite. And of course, as the title says, in this video you will learn a lot about Pyrite. So we are going to talk about what is a cluster versus a crystal. We are going to talk about the different crystal shapes Pyrite makes. We're going to find out how you can determine the value of pyrite uh, on a bulk or cutting level and also on the level of a fine mineral collector. And we're going to see a lot of combinations of minerals with pyrite from Peru. So as I said, a lot to learn, a lot to talk about. Let's go right into the matter. First of all, pyrite or iron pyrite is a mixture of sulfur and uh, iron. To be exact, approximately 54% of sulfur and 46 point something percent of iron in there. Uh, it's also widely, widely known as fool's gold because it looks really golden sometimes and some people get confused when they find that and think they have found gold. Uh, nevertheless, in con there is also some gold in pyrite, by the way, and I'm getting very often the question how to extract it. It's a, it's a very complicated process, too expensive to do, so it's better to mine for gold uh, than trying to extract it from the pyrite. In comparison to gold, however, pyrite is very, very common. You can find it all over the earth, uh, mixed with many, many uh, other minerals. So uh, basically scientists call it a ubiquitous uh, min uh, mineral because it's basically everywhere. If you walk along a beach, for example, and you see how the wave, the water is going over the beach, moving the sand, you often see that, that glimmer that, that is many times pyrite, uh, which is there grinded into sand. And as I said, we can find it in a lot of minerals. I brought you uh, a few examples from Peruvian minerals and from minerals from other countries. So for example, we can find it in serpentinite. Here you see that patch of pyrite that has been polished in the per uh, serpentinite heart. You can have it as very tiny flicks within uh, rhodonite, for example. Yeah, there are tiny flicks here. Then, um, uh, it's very important for us in terms of giving value to uh, black jade or Lemurian jade. If you look at this uh, pyramid, for example, you see here a patch of pyrite, you see here a line of pyrite, uh, and there are also little tiny flecks of pyrite, and that gives character to the carved products of black jade. Here, you have, for example, you have a small um, palm stone and you see this line of pyrite here going through the stone and sometimes we have we are lucky and these lines are cracking up the line is here on the on the border of that piece and when it cracks up like along the line then we suddenly can see that is a layer of pyrite crystals that is going through the uh, black jade so that's a rough piece here that has been cut and cracked up and you can see that is the line that you see here the line and if you would break it up along the line you would see the pyrite crystal layer um, pyrite as tiny little flecks you can find it in uh, for example in lapis lazuli uh, here I have a sample of uh, Canadian pinolite and even in the Canadian pinolite, we can see tiny little flecks of pyrite. So pyrite really is everywhere, but uh, in these kind of lines and flecks and patches, that's not really what we want to see. We want to see the pyrite crystals, so let's talk about that. So in the beginning of the video we have to make some very basic definitions because there are terms used in the crystal world that are actually very confusing. For example, in the most crystal shops everything is called a crystal. For example, this is a polished uh, free form of uh, chocolate calcite 
and that is commonly called a crystal. Now that's far from being a crystal, it has nothing to do with a crystal, that is a form shaped out of an amorph mass of mineral and definitely not what we would call a crystal. Now if you look at the next piece here, uh, that might look like a crystal, it's not a crystal either, that is just a carved free form from a mass of pyrite that just looks like a crystal maybe, but it's not a crystal. So what actually is a crystal? When we talk about a crystal, we are referring to a naturally grown geometric shape. That can be any kind of shape. So we're having crystals that are spheres, we're having crystals that are like, uh, like little tubes, we have cubes, we have we have balls, we have, there are any number of shapes of crystals, but when we refer to a crystal, then we are talking about a naturally geometrical form that nature has made. Now, when several of these crystals are together on a stone, like for example on this really big piece here, you have a lot of different crystals on there, so that is called a cluster of crystal or crystal cluster. So now we have learned the difference, what is a crystal, what is not a crystal, and uh, we between the difference between a crystal cluster and a crystal. Now let's look at what are the typical shapes of pyrite crystals. Now the most commonly known shape of a pyrite crystal is a cube, and here we have a really big example for that, cubic growth of pyrite, but in Peru that is only one of three main shapes. The other shape that we would find is the pyritohedron, and uh, here we have a very nice example of pyritohedron sitting on that cluster. A pyritohedron is, looks like kind of a sphere that has been faceted. The third shape of crystals that we have very common in Peru is the octahedron. Many people call that triangles because uh, they are looking like triangles uh, when they are massed together but the single crystal, if you are lucky to find a specimen where you can see the single crystal, is actually looking like two pyramids that have been glued together at the base forming a shape with eight sides. So you have that here, you have the four upper sides and here you have the four lower sides. That's an octahedron, octa for eight, eight sides, an octahedron. So now as we said we have three main shapes, the cube, the pyrotohedron and the octahedron, but these are the main shapes. Now geology in Peru is a little bit complicated and pyrite does what it wants. So there are a number of intermediate shapes. So let me give you an example here that piece here it might look like a cube but then if you look at the corners of the cube they're not pointed they're kind of rounded away as if this thing wants to become a pyritohedron crystal so we have here probably an intermediary between a pyritohedron and a cube and in this other piece I have a intermediary shape that is also very strange that probably has been uh, on the way to become a pyritohedron but then it it's kind of flattened as if you would have stamped on it of course that's just an idea but it's looking kind of flattened and it actually doesn't fit any of the shapes that we know anymore so uh, there you can see that pyrite is very variable and makes a lot of different shapes. Scientists have made a study in Peru and have found that there are approximately 26 different intermediary shapes between the three main shapes. So if you're a collector of uh, crystals and you want to have all the variations of crystals in pyrite in Peru, you will have to collect a long time to get all these intermediary shapes. Before we switch to another topic, uh, one more word about crystal shapes. I mean, we have been calling this shape a cube and that is what it probably looks like to the superficial um, um, viewer, but uh, nevertheless, actually it's not a cube. It's a cuboid, meaning it's a 3D rectangle. And if we look at this one, for example, then we can clearly see that 
this side is longer than that side. And that happens with all these pyrite crystals that are cuboid. They are actually hexahedrons, meaning there's always a different length of sides. Sometimes it's a very, very tiny difference and they really appear to be cubes, but they are not. Another interesting fact about the cubes are the growth lines that we can see on them. We're referring to these lines that are going here on the surface of the crystal. These are growth lines and the interesting thing in this is that they are organized to each other in a very clear way. So for example, if you have the growth lines going like this on this side and you will turn to this side, they go like this. So they are orthogonal to this side. Here they go like this and here they go like that. And then on the next side, they are going like that. So they are orthogonal to this, we have it. here they go like that, here they go like that, and here they go like that. So they are always organized in an orthogonal way in comparison to the lines on the other side of the cube. Sometimes these crystals are breaking off in the, in the cave, in the nature, they fall off the wall and then you can see the break surface here but sometimes when these broken off pieces are lying around a lot of uh, many many years then these surfaces that have been broken are starting to recrystallize and then it looks like that it's a very shiny break off surface so that is recrystallizing it started the process of becoming a crystal again and sometimes one can cut these parts off and then one gets these very tiny slices, very, very brilliant, shiny uh, surfaces that then can become uh, designer caps or other things. You don't have to polish that, it has a natural shine. So uh, the break of surfaces that are recrystallizing are very interesting for jewelry. And finally, a last phenomenon that we can observe on many of Peruvian pyrite crystals, which is called edging. You can see that here, it's a very shiny surface, but it, then it looks like kind of edged in there. That is when the crystal is redissolving himself uh, in the process of growth. Okay, so before we jump into another topic about how to value, how to give price value, two crystals uh, of pyrite. I just wanted to tell you that, of course, we have a lot of collector specimen, and if you're a crystal collector, you can buy those specimen on our web shop, which is gemrockshop.com. And if you have a crystal shop and want to buy crystals for your shop at wholesale price, then you can register your company on our wholesale page gemrockinternational.com. You will find both links in the description below the video. Okay, so the next question is, how do you determine the value of pyrite? In general terms, uh, there is a definition that is determining the value by the size of the crystal. And with that, I do not say the size of the crystal cluster but the size of the individual crystal. And how does that work? That is the criteria we as a crystal a lapidary shop workshop that cuts pyrite, we are applying that when we buy pyrite from the mine and when we wholesale pyrite. So let's take, for example, this cluster of pyrite crystals. You will see that the crystals on this cluster are very, very tiny. We're talking here about crystals of maybe one millimeter size per crystal on this cluster and that is called in Spanish quinoa, like the, the, the corn, uh, the grains of the corn quinoa. Uh, they, they took the, na the name from that, so that is quinoa pyrite, which is the cheapest pyrite because the crystals are so small, like sand grains, and because uh, of this material, a lot of this material comes out of the mine. And that is actually not really used as a specimen, maybe on a mass market for, for, children's, uh, for, for children presents or, or something like that. But it's really not a very um, 
commercial size of crystal. So sometimes this material is used for cutting purposes. So you would have a big block of that and then you would cut it into pieces and make hearts and polished spheres out of that material that then have tiny little druses where you have this shine in there. But again, even for uh, spheres and hearts, I personally do not recommend that material because it's just not looking as nice as pyrite can be. So when we are cutting uh, spheres and other materials in our workshop for our clients, we always recommend our clients to choose Chispa pyrite. Chispa is the next size of crystals and if you look at this cluster of crystals then you can see that each of the crystals is between one and three millimeters of size. So definitely much bigger the crystals than in quinoa pyrite. And uh, we think that this is the much more beautiful uh, pyrite to cut because you make imagine a sphere out of that. And then you have the druses with these uh, beautiful crystals inside. So that's still cutting material uh, that maybe also can be sold on a mass market uh, as specimen, but it's definitely below the level that you would collect as a collector of specimen, as a fine mineral collector. You would not collect uh, cheese papyrite nor quinoa pyrite because it's so very much common. Probably 95% of what's coming out of a mine is either quinoa or cheese papyrite. And for cutting purposes, definitely uh, cheese papyrite is the better one. And of course, it has more, is it more pricey than a quinoa. Okay, so the next higher level after chispa would be a chispa top or a chispa premium uh, material where then the crystals would between would be between three and five millimeters of size so a little bit bigger again and then would be the next level which is uh, kokara and there you would have crystals like on this cluster between five and seven millimeters of size uh, in in each crystal on that cluster and then you would get to the next level and each level gets a gets more expensive because it's more rare so the next level would then be a kokara top or kokara premium cluster where the crystals then are going between seven and uh, seven millimeters and one centimeter and uh, then if it gets bigger than this like like here then we're talking about quadros or cubes cubos uh, and that is definitely then collector's level. So if we are talking about uh, fine mineral collector's level, then probably uh, crystals would start at Chispa top, Chispa premium, upwards, more likely Kokara, Kokara top, and definitely then cubes or quadros, the big ones are collector's levels while the material that has smaller crystals basically goes into the cutting process of lapidary shops and of course as you can imagine the process or the price of these crystals is always more expensive from level to level to level price per kilo increases okay so now we have been evaluating the value or how to give value to pyrite crystals in the bulk or mass level and in the lower or medium collectors level. Now how is price determined in the fine mineral level? What are fine minerals? Let's give you an example. We are processing a lot of pyrite in our company and let's say we are getting a ton of pyrite. A ton means thousand kilos. And in these thousand kilos, probably 70 to 80% are bulk material that is then used for cutting. And then there might be some 20 or 30% of that material that is lower to medium collector's level. And within these pieces, you probably find one or two pieces of the thousands of pieces that are in a ton that you would uh, say that's a collector's level. Uh, or a fine mineral level. Uh, also, this is not the regular material that comes out. Fine mineral uh, level is basically find in, found in small bubbles within uh, the pyrite veins. When that opens up, 
the, it's just a few pieces and uh, then the bubble is gone. It's not like a continuous vein. And these pieces are very, very rare. So fine mineral pieces in pyrite are very rare. I have here a piece that would qualify for a fine mineral piece. And we can see here it's not only pyrite, it's pyrite mixed with big points of clear quartz. And now the question is, how would you determine the value of something like that? And there are many criteria that we would apply as um, crystal dealers that cannot be standardized. Means it's an individual opinion of the dealer and then you either pay the price or you don't pay the price. You're either uh, being uh, agreeing to that or you're not agreeing to that. Um, so what are the not standardized criteria that we would apply to such a piece? First of all, rarity. The rarity is given because I explained to you there have to be thousands of pieces that are regular till you get one of these pieces or you find a small bubble and, and you get out of that bubble a few, a handful of pieces in the mine and then the bubble is gone. So it's clear, it's clear rarity is one of the criteria for price in fine minerals. The more rare something is, the more higher its price. That's simple logic. So a second criteria would be the luster of the specimen. And here we have an example, of course, of pyrite that is very brilliant, has a high luster. And here I have an example of a specimen that doesn't have a good luster. And you can immediately see the difference because this is not shining very well. This is kind of matte and this is shining very much. Now, why does this thing have no luster? We don't know. Sometimes the crystal is coming out by nature without a good luster. And the problem is that this lack of luster makes that beautiful piece, have beautiful crystals, makes it unsellable. So basically, not having luster devaluates a crystal in 95%. So that's basically a non-sellable pyrite that will stay forever in our shop and will never be sold. While collectors in the fine minerals level look for absolute top luster. So size is a rather ambiguous criteria for value. It would apply if we would have two pieces like this that would look more or less the same, same mineral com a combination and one would be like half the size of that one, then size would be a matter but really uh, rarity and other factors are more important than size. Another criteria would be uh, what we call a freak specimen. A freak specimen is when the crystal has a very very strange unusual shape for some geological reason that there is no explanation maybe for that. Uh, then that is a very rare specimen and then of course it has a higher value and the aesthetics of a piece also play a role but you know how would you standardize aesthetics some people like it like this some people like it like that but there are of course certain rules of positioning of the crystals on the cluster if it looks balanced or it looks kind of odd and out of shape then it's probably not that value if it is, looks like balanced or has the cluster in a certain position that puts the attention to that piece. Uh, these are kind of aesthetic evaluations that can also determine the value of a crystal, especially if there are several pieces of the same kind of material, then the more aesthetic one, the more balanced one will be the more costly one. And the last criteria for uh, crystal value is often the combination of that crystal with other minerals. So in the next step, we will clean out this table and we'll show you a lot of crystal combinations, pyrite with other minerals, just to give you an idea how variable Peruvian geology is. Okay, so last but not least, we have some uh, combinations of pyrite with other minerals here on the table for you, just to give you an idea about the great diversity of crystal combinations that we can have in Peru. Well, the first one you have already seen for quite a while, big quartz crystal needles or points together with pyrite cubes. And sometimes it can look like this one where the quartz is small, 
microscopic and here you have in this case pyritohedron crystals distributed and that also would be a good example for an aesthetic uh, fine mineral specimen because it has an odd shape that is somehow very interesting so aesthetics is another factor that determines price as we already know another specimen is this one again the base is basically pyrite and then we have Svalera here but here on that part we have another mineral which is called tetraedrite so it's a little bit more silvery shiny than the sphalerite and has formed a film of small crystals on top of that crystal tetraedrite yeah. another example would be this piece here where we have again quartz points then the black material that is around the quartz points is sphalerite in the case of Peru that's mostly marmatite, a variation of sphalerite with more iron content and then we can see that in between the marmatite or sphalerite we have a pyrite crystals and that can of course also look the other way around meaning we're having pyrite crystals in this case it's octahedrons and on top of the pyrite crystals we have smaller pieces of sphalerite or marmatite again we have a very thick coverage of sphalerite or marmatite on top of pyritohedron crystals big crystals and then we have here a third mineral which is these silvery crystals and that is galena no, galena is lead basically crystals of lead so here we have three minerals we have pyrite sphalerite and galena on this piece we have a matrix of probably white orthoclase and in between we have these tiny crystals um, pyritohedron shaped crystal loose crystals that's another variation and as I said size is not always important here we have a very beautiful specimen with a beautiful mixture of white quartz then we have here a tiny little cluster of, of clear quartz points small ones then we have here cubic pyrite and on top of the cubic pyrite we have sphalerite a very very tight small but very beautiful specimen for collectors now the last two pieces I have here are very special first this one which is a calcite fluorescent calcite mixed with pyrite uh, we cannot clean the pyrite uh, with acids or something that is normally used because that would uh, eliminate the calcite so that is only water cleaned and that's why there's still an oxide layer on the pyrite and makes it looking red but in order to see the beauty of that piece let's look at it under uv light we'll switch the light off and put the uv light on top of that in the dark and only putting the uv light on top of the piece we can see that beautiful orange fluorescence of the calcite and we can see that the calcite penetrates the entire rock there's always this orange shine. Very, very beautiful specimen. And our last specimen, last but not least, is this wonderful piece of rhodochrosite with pyrite and with fluorescent fluorite. It's a beauty to look at this under daylight, but again, under UV light, it will look absolutely marvelous. So let's have a look. Okay, so under the UV light, you can see the beautiful pinkish blue fluorescence of the fluoride okay that was our updated video absolutely all about pyrite i hope you learned a lot again if you have a crystal shop and want to wholesale uh, pyrite crystals from us please register your company at the website gemrockinternational.com 
the link is below in the comments. And if you are a collector and you want to buy any of these or many more species of specimen that we have in our website, just go to gemrockshop.com where you find all this specimen and many more for sale. Uh, if you have a question, leave a comment, uh, press the like button, and importantly, follow us in our YouTube channel for many more videos on Peruvian crystals and on lapidary cutting and quality and ethical mining.